Globus. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. After that fantastic Raku and lunch, this is even better. So here we go. <laughs> so good afternoon. Um, we have a very important topic to discuss. Before we get into the specific question of the panel, I was just going to ask each of the gentlemen to comment about just setting the stage on where they're coming from. I guess we'll start with Robert to set the context of the overall economy and his view. And I'll ask each of our uh, CEOs and presidents to comment about their business and their sectors. And then we'll get right into it. So maybe, Robert, I can start uh, with you. Thank you very much. Um, as for the overall economy, let me raise a couple issues. One is a decoupling. This is the decoupling of the economy and the stock market. Um, the economic indicators, as you know, in many countries have just crashed bounced back to a certain extent, uh, but uh, they have not uh, come back anywhere close to where they were even before COVID started. And yet the stock markets are very, very strong. The outlook for the global economy is for global GDP uh, to return to the level when COVID hit by the end of next year. So we've had a bounce back for a couple quarters now, not so great, but it will be a very, very slow recovery after that. There are differences among countries. Japan is probably about average. It will also come back, we think, by the end of next year. Uh, but some countries will lag, some will be a little bit faster. There's also a difference among industries. So we have to be very careful when we say things are returning to normal. Uh, the standard deviation is very large on that. The stock market, on the other hand, has been doing very, very well. I think this is largely because the central banks have been so aggressive in taking measures to support um, the economy. So for example, if you look at the balance uh, of uh, JGB holdings by the Bank of Japan, it was actually you know, coming down. And now it's bounced right back up again. So my view is that the stock markets are being supported by monetary policy, but not necessarily uh, by uh, the economy itself. A second point on um, uh, differentials. One of the things I find most troubling about the response in many countries to COVID uh, is the uh, increasing gap uh, of uh, income or the income differentials caused by COVID. Uh, for folks in industries where you can work from home, fortunately mine is one of them, uh, we're not experiencing huge uh, disruptions. IT is pretty good. Uh, for uh, the panel we just had before lunch, um, there was uh, a lot of optimism uh, among the young entrepreneurs that people are coming to them because of COVID. However, if you work in the restaurant industry or in, say, haircut industry, you've got a bigger problem. Is society taking the measures we need to support the income of those peoples and then also to get them retrained? So my view is that the income inequality problem is actually being made worse by COVID, and it's not something we've been able to deal with uh, too, too well. A third point is on national governance, and I think we need to be very careful here. Uh, there is a narrative out there that authoritarian governments uh, have dealt with COVID better than democrat democratic governments. I think this is false. And the reason I say that is if you look at the data on the cases of COVID as a share of the population, graphed against the deaths as a share of the population, there's a very clear, almost linear relationship if you look at logarithms of the percentage changes. Very clear relationship across countries. Some are much worse than others. But it's a very clear linear relationship. At the very bottom, you have two countries who've done the best. One is China, very authoritarian country. Um, you have to take out Hubei province, which is sort of in the middle, if you call it a country of the others. But China has done very well. So has Taiwan. They're almost identical. One is authoritarian, one is um, uh, democratic. So this is not about dem democracy versus authoritarianism. It's about competent leadership. Um, we have to be a little bit careful there because even good leadership can not r bring you a good result if there isn't good followership. Okay? And this is where the issue of, um, of uh, income differentials, I think, comes in. Because one of the big differences between, say, the United States and China uh, is that income differentials have grown immensely in both countries, but in China. The bottom 50% of the population has seen real income grow by about 4% per year for the last 40 years. In the United States, 
that number is zero. So which country is going to have a population that listens to the leadership? So I think actually social policy, long-term social policy, and income differentials have something to do with the ability of a country to address a sudden crisis like of it. Uh, and yet, that is, to me, yet another reason uh, why addressing some of these social issues is so, so important for us. Right. Thank you so much, Robert, for setting the global and macro stage. Maybe I can ask uh, Turi-san to now talk about the world of pharma and uh, your company specifically. I've been asking every pharma CEO I know, when is the vaccine coming? <laughs> I know it's later than what the US president might say, but it would be great to get your macro view of the pharma industry as well as what you've, uh, you've seen in your neighborhood. Sure, thank you. Novartis is a Swiss pharma company, uh, ranking top three. Uh, sales is uh, $47 billion, and we have 100,000 people working in 150 countries. In Japan, we have 4,000 people doing the $3 billion sales. Uh, impact on business-wise, briefly, uh, there has been clearly a uh, cutback in patient visits, mostly children and seniors, but that's been compensated by doctors writing longer prescriptions for maybe up to three months, not one month. So uh, business impact-wise, not that negative. Now, as Novartis, in a way to combat coronavirus, we are embarking upon more than a dozen testing of uh, compounds which we have for other uses. So to see the, I mean, these are the compounds which have been proven to be safe. So to see if any of, the, any of these work, may work for coronavirus. Uh, we used to be in the vaccine business, but we uh, sold it to uh, uh, more than five years ago. It's a challenging business, which I'll explain briefly. So uh, right now it's reported 150 vaccines are being tested, and six of these are in the uh, major final stage of uh, large-scale clinical studies. Now, uh, what we have to uh, remember is the uh, vaccine doesn't work or protect everybody. It works maybe about half of the people. And also the, uh, having a vaccine is one thing, but to the mass population who are prepared to take it, the survey of the states one third of Americans are saying they will never take vaccine, even if they are provided free of charge because of safety and other reasons. That's one point. And then uh, it takes usually uh, many years, 11 years, up to 11 years, and the chance of success is only 6%. Now, because of the safety uh, testing, vaccination is given to healthy people, so you have to really make sure it's safe. And it requires many thousands of studies. Now, with COVID, there is urgency and political pressure. So uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, nine vaccine makers, CEOs, made an announcement. They'll never compromise data, they'll control against the political pressure. So that's the risk because uh, usually it, uh, it takes longer, but they have to short shortcut and the result may be disappointment and then loss of trust, which we have to avoid. Another complexity is the uh, supplies. We are talking about supplying to uh, billions of people. And usually uh, safety is confirmed. First, efficacy is proven, safety confirmed, and then start pro producing. Right now, things are moving in parallel. So vaccine companies are already stockpiling doses. Japanese government, I think, secured 300 million doses. If it doesn't work, if it's not safe, this must be destroyed. Another thing is the distribution. You have to make sure it reaches the right people, which is everybody. You don't like to see vaccines used by rich countries, rich people only. Also tracing, some vaccines may have to be taken uh, maybe those twice or three times, so you have to make sure to know who got it, who didn't get it, so uh, long story. But I think to your first question, uh, estimation we talk internally is the uh, sometime next year, hopefully end of this year, so that's the prediction. Thank you. So both Robert and you have given me some hope that sometime next year we may be back to a new normal. But I wonder, uh, Inagaki-san, perhaps you can talk about the wonderful world of insurance and what has happened to your industry in light okay. of where we are. And then I'll move to some questions about SDG investments next. I think I, I'm one of, I represent one of the, the old type uh, Japanese firms uh, in this G1 global setting. So. Let me uh, introduce what we went through for the past six months. So all the business dinners and, and business golf outings were cancelled. Um, and 
those seminars, on-site seminars for the, for the young recruits, uh, the newcomers, uh, are done by uh, on, online uh, seminars. And that really, those shift was, it was a very extraordinary six months for us. So I worked for, with Daiichi for 34 years. Um, and suddenly, all of a sudden, I have never done uh, work from home until my 34 year history. But all of a sudden, I'm, roughly I'm doing 50% uh, work from home. But this was a shock for us, a real shock. And all of a sudden, abundant time came to us and we started to think how we should utilize this, this abundant times uh, to the future. So it was a good uh, plus uh, thing. Uh, but the uh, situation at the sales rep level, uh, at the forefront of our customer connection, it was very hard time for the past six year, months because um, insurance consulting, as you can easily imagine, it's a, it's a face to face uh, consulting. Uh, sometimes it's take, it's, it takes over one hour to, to do a sales pitch, and it's done face to face. So, what we decided is to refrain from new sales activities for the past six months. It was a tough decision. All of our sales agents are basically commission-based. So I made a decision to, to protect their income, so kind of protecting them, uh, their salaries for, for what they did in the past six months. So uh, our new sales, uh, in terms of policy, number of policy we sold, uh, was only 30% year on year. So uh, easily imagine, you know, the supply went down drastically uh, in terms of new sales. But, you know, I, I protected the income uh, of our uh, labor, so uh, in, in a P&L sense or economical sense, it was very hard. But, uh, and it was, you know, Daiichi has 118 year history, but this was our first time that our sales branch does not have a sales target. So they don't have a target. Uh, what I ask them to do is to think about your community and promote quality of life of their community. And it was a you know, totally uh, different thing that what we were used to. And actually, the good thing is they really thought it through. Um, so you know, uh, donating uh, face masks, uh, sanitizers, um, helping their customer, uh, like uh, uh, food and beverage company, uh, you know, use, utilizing their office to distribute takeout menus, um, providing information about COVID. And actually, the happy thing uh, was that our employee satisfaction survey, uh, it, it jumped up very much. So, and we realized that we spent so much time in how to sell insurance. And our nature or our founder uh, started life insurance to, to protect and work as a safety net for our communities. And we suddenly realized uh, the, the true purpose of, of our company. So it was a economically very hard six months, but I think we got uh, and realized our purpose of our business. So, you know, uh, as a CEO, uh, I'm happy that we had this six months. That's a very, uh, I'll stop it here. <laughs> That's a very inspiring uh, story of some of the few silver linings we've all probably experienced during these last unprecedented uh, seven or eight months. Um, but it was a year ago, actually, I moderated a panel here also about uh, the announcement that the, um, uh, a, a group of US CEOs made at the business roundtable saying that we're no longer, can you believe this, business people said we're no longer in the business of earning our income and, and creating wealth for just our shareholders, but that all stakeholders were important, like community, as Inagaki-san mentioned. Now, that sounds very nice in light of the, well, the stock market, as Robert said, is a bit overinflated, but economically, many, many sectors have been hurt. So the question I'd like to pose each of the gentlemen, and I'm gonna ask you guys to raise your hand, is what do you think is indeed the affordability with all of what's going on? Can companies, should companies continue to invest and invest in causes that are around SDGs, sustainable development goals, or is now you know not the time, and do they need to pull back? 
uh, I work with a company called Boston Consulting Group, and our research says, and we've been doing investor pulse surveys every month since the crisis, 51% of investors say they will continue, which means 49% are feeling a little bit of a pain. So how many of you are in the 51%? Okay, because this is a very easy panel that we have our 49%. Okay. okay. Well, that's interesting. Why don't we start with Robert and compare how Japanese corporates may be feeling versus global corporates perhaps as well. Okay, thanks very much. Um, on the issue of whether uh, Japanese corporations are pulling back or coming in on SDG or uh, ESG investments, uh, I think, uh, well, my sense of Japanese companies is that, in fact, they're probably accelerating. Uh, not only because it's the right thing to do, but in this business environment, uh, the role of business is actually to help solve social problems. We have problems with the environment, we have problems with aging, we have problems with the medical system. Um, the role of business is to address these problems. And so if SDGs, or ESG itself, is the, uh, the issue that society faces, the role of business is to come up with ways to solve those issues most effectively, most efficiently, and if we do that, that's good business. So my sense is that Jap Japan is actually accelerating on that. The notion of stakeholders has been in Japan for a very long time. Perhaps as an excuse not to pay out dividends, okay? but now there's a, a more balanced approach. That said, the insiders in Japanese company, companies, the, the guys who get, and it's mostly guys, the high salaries, receive those salaries at the expense of the outsiders. This is something that has not really been addressed. And so in the early session this morning when uh, Minister Kono was talking about labor reforms, I said, I'm looking forward to what they do because the labor reforms from a couple of years ago really were not very successful. So to me, that's one of the, the key things in bringing sustainability to all this. Another one uh, is uh, the importance of uh, the climate issue. Uh, this is an issue that all of us face. It's in our faces right now. Too many typhoons, too many floods. Um, this is also a huge opportunity for Japanese business. If we can move forward on the deregulation in the power business, in the energy business, there's so much wonderful new technology now that companies can implement that technology, make a lot of money, and help save the world at the same time. It's a sample yoshi, I think is the, uh, the, the phrase for it. Um, so good for uh, society, good for yourself, uh, good for uh, your workers. Um, so I think that's actually quite, quite important. Uh, and um, uh, my new book that I just put out a couple weeks ago puts that in as the fr front chapter because that's where I think the opportunities are. So actually I think Japanese companies are accelerating on on this. So Rather COVID is an accelerant to ESG investments. Uh, Inagaki-san, what is your view? I completely agree uh, to you, uh, what you have said. Um, so Japanese companies are, uh, are good at, well, resilient uh, in times of crisis. So what happened at, at the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, a lot of uh, companies invested in their communities uh, rather than the bottom line profits. And I think that that's the good part of Jap uh, Japanese companies, but uh, they don't get serious until crisis hits. So that, that is a problem of Japanese companies. And my company also the same, <laughs> I have to admit. So uh, I, I touched on, you know, we, we went back to our purpose. And I think this, under these times of crisis, we, we, we have the, you know, uh, now we, we start to realize what we are here for. And so life insurance, we, the internal discussion we discussed that our biggest stakeholders are, are the, the beneficiaries of the death protection. So the next generation is our biggest shareholder, uh, stakeholders. But we don't really realize that because you know, we, we receive premium from the, the current policy holders but they are the payers, but not, not the beneficiaries. Uh, but you know, the, what the uh, policyholder is uh, want from us is to uh, pay the, the amount uh, with, uh, uh, economically to their beneficiaries. And at the same time, we have to you know, pass on our society to the next generation. That is the reason why 
uh, we accelerated our ESG investment un under this, this COVID crisis. Uh, we invested in those uh, vaccine bonds or other uh, renewable energies, uh, a lot of those initiatives, because you know, we, we suddenly realized that uh, we want to uh, chase uh, two goals. Uh, as, as an institutional investor, we have to maintain our investment returns, but at the same time, uh, we have to secure the, the, the society for the next generation. So we got serious on, in investing those uh, social impact uh, investments and those uh, renewable uh, climate related uh, initiatives. So, so you know, uh, we, we our, our employees are much more aligned in what we do. So I think this six months was a good, good timing for us to push more ahead on those initiatives. Thank you. Well, this is the G1 summit. So Horisan invites people that are leaders of Japan. So I'm sure I guess. <laughs> Tori san will also agree with the statement that now is the time perhaps to invest in SDGs versus not. Sure. I, <laughs> but you don't have to say yes. I, <laughs> this topic I speak on behalf of global uh, headquarters because uh, we uh, are an affiliate in Japan. So the, uh, one of the uh, strategic priorities for Novartis is to build trust with society. So we have the ambition to become uh, uh, the uh, industry leader in sustainability. So we have a couple of metrics. And one of them is the, uh, to become uh, uh, carbon neutral by including all supply uh, chains by 2025 and plastic water neutrality by 2030. So these are metrics. And I think our company is ranking top seven in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. So we are doing fine there. This uh, investment will never stop. I'd like to talk about maybe two areas. One is the uh, access to medicine, which is the area where we can really show the maximum benefit. So we, uh, uh, we have a policy to provide our medicine to whoever needs it, no matter where, where they live and who they are. And especially in low and mid-income countries, so mostly African countries. And this is uh, becoming even more important under the COVID situation. We have partnership with the uh, Gates Foundation, uh, along with other companies. And the aim is to come up with uh, and also deliver the uh, vaccination, vaccine and also diagnostics treatment for everybody in the world, uh, especially uh, at the highest risk and the poorest people. So that's the you know, initiative we are part of it. Uh, another area I'd like to talk about is the employee uh, associates, who is the, uh, like you say, one of the uh, main stakeholders. Uh, upon uh, initiation of COVID virus, uh, COVID management announced there'll be no layoffs from COVID. And that's what we are seeking to. There has been nobody who was downsized due to COVID. Uh, we are investing a lot of money for the uh, people development. Annually, $200 million is being, being spent. And everybody has a free access to uh, 35 online courses uh, coming from uh, well-known universities. Uh, everybody is encouraged to spend 100 hours per year for self-learning. So that's something from Navadis. Thank you very much. Maybe I can shift gears a little bit to now talk about some specific topics within this framework. I was going to ask uh, for you all to comment about diversity, digital transformation, things that COVID has accelerated in the context of the discussion we just talked about. Um, maybe we'll start with actually diversity. Um, and you know, there's all, the definition of diversity, the discourse has also become diverse. It's not only a male female issue, obviously. Uh, but if I just focus on the, the gender gap and what COVID has done, the data is striking. I know we heard some uh, wonderful panels this morning, if you were here this morning, about the new ways of working uh, and how it's impacted women in Japan. But across the world, in light of the fact that schools have shut down and whatnot, um, on average, you know, most families have found that they're working more hours a week to take care of their children, to take care of the household, to take care of the elderly. It's about 15, 19 hours a week on top. 60% of Japanese, American, now dual income families are taking care of their kids in a way they've never experienced before. The number is more like 70% in Canada, Australia. And uh, the latest data that I saw from the US is that in fact, though this is so hard that 15% of women in the Americas who are in dual income situations just feel like they can't keep this up anymore. That it is very stressful and while we've kind of barely survived, you know, many countries are still 
in shutdown mode. So in light of that diversity, all of you are in corporate, government, public, public private sectors. I think it's, it's now a, a business imperative. I think people get that, but the executionability of it in terms of what we now do, uh, given that all that's happened is, I think, a important and very hot topic. So I don't know if I may actually come back to you, Tori-san, to talk about diversity um, as you know, your company or your individual views about how we continue to invest in it because it's part of the solution, but right now the diverse populations are more disproportionately affected by COVID. Okay. Let me talk about diversity in the framework of a new way to work. So our company has really started the journey to uh, come up with a framework of new way of working, which is we, we call choice with responsibility. So everybody has uh, freedom to uh, choose where and how to work without getting even approval of the boss. That, what that means is the uh, Everybody has a responsibility to, to deliver, and they have to make sure they really form the boss and also colleagues. But this requires a new mindset because everything is up to uh, up to them. And you said you were about 10, 15 percent of the week in the in office. Japan, actually, in Japan, actually, yes, I do only one Saturday, maybe half a day per week. And right now, 10 to 15 percent of the people come to uh, come to the office. And uh, actually, I'm talking to uh, half a dozen people every week. And since I end of July started, so I spoke to uh, more than 50 so far. And nobody wants to come back to the office full time. So uh, that was clear. <laughs> With the flexibility to come to the office when they want it, you know, for networking, maybe for picking up the mail, whatever. But that's the basic. And they tell me uh, productivity never went down. They know how to manage. And for they, when they feel lonely, they do check in. Some do every day for five minutes. Others do once a week, uh, once every two weeks. So that's working well. There was a survey done globally talking to uh, half of the people, which is 60,000 people. So globally, 74% of the people want to stay with online, and only 12% of the people want to come back full time. But Japan is even more extreme. So that's the situation. Now, uh, once we can achieve this, what that means is the uh, young people who look for a job, they, you know, the uh, flexible working is a prerequisite for a good employer. Also, we can tap into, I mean, we can reach to untapped talent pool, people who live in uh, far away in Japan, but also overseas without you know, having them, without they having to relocate. So uh, that's going to open up a new horizon. So diversity for us, this, you know, so far some people might have said this is nice to have, but this, is, this, wanna be, uh, this became business critical. And diversity for gender, and gender goal we have is uh, for the global, 50-50. Uh, uh, male and female. Uh, management to managers global set up we actually tolerate forty four percent. In Japan we are still twenty percent. Everybody combined we are thirty percent. So uh, still journey continues. So uh, it can be senior, can be non Japanese people and who can you know this we can we include in the diversity. So uh, I think uh, we really have to uh, keep up with that. Well, you're certainly ahead of the head of the Japanese government. We just pushed back our goals by 10 years, so <laughs> you're doing much better. Uh, Inagaki-san and Robert, your comments on diversity? Uh, yes, so uh, Daichi Life um, is, is unique it, that 90% uh, of our sales, uh, of our workforce is women. And if I limit to uh, sales agents, nearly 100% are women. So a lot of uh, women workforce uh, supports the IT. And uh, in April, uh, when we had the, the voluntary lockdown or self restraints, um, the, all the schools were closed, the, the nursery care facilities were closed. So uh, I, I talked with the HR people uh, last week, and there was, uh, uh, you know, the women actual working hours extended. Well, they were, uh, we, we're lucky that we installed this uh, remote PC for, for every employees uh, last year. Uh, it was lucky because you know we, we are anticipating Tokyo Olympics and one of our head office is in near Harumi. So uh, we thought that you know we couldn't get into the Harumi area, so you know we, we uh, distributed uh, a laptop PC to all our employees. And the, the women workforce were able to work from home, but at the same time uh, they have to you know, work with their three-year-old kids running around, and and they were distracted, uh, under pressure. 
So uh, it was a very hard time for us. But as the lockdown eases, uh, uh, they get used to the work and they love the flexibility of the work. And I, I got a very encouraging figure uh, that for the past six months, the number of childcare leave went down drastically. And also the, the nursing care leave, uh, mainly done by women in Japan, I think, uh, went down drastically also. So this flexibility had the, had the minus uh, initially, but I think net-net, you know, the, the fl flexibility of our work style is a plus uh, for us in, in terms of diversity. Great. Robert? Hey, thanks very much. Um, let me approach this from an economic perspective, which is, first of all, um, the role that basic income could play in, in helping on this. One of the um, most interesting results from uh, case studies of basic income is that uh, hours of work actually do not decline when you introduce basic income. Okay? The only subgroups for which there are some declines, and they're not large, are single mothers with small children and a few people who want to go to college. Okay? So what basic income actually does is it rewards, particularly women, for the work they do that is not compensated in GDP. So that, I think, is an important element. And what we're experiencing with COVID now, I think, actually has some relevance to this debate on basic income. A second thing, a very academic approach, but uh, on the role and the benefits of diversity in teams. There's a, a scholar at the MIT Media Lab named Alex Pentland, very interesting guy. He's got a book called Social Physics. It's translated into Japanese as Sosharu Butsurigaku. And what he says in this book is basically you can look at a team's performance um, without looking at the talent of the people in the team. What you look at is how closely the team is connected to each other. Do they talk a lot? Do they talk equally to each other? And how many connections do each of the members have to the outside? This is a, a point of diversity. Okay? Diversity means that you talk to a lot of people and a lot of different people. So Pentland's research, I think, gives very numerical, uh, big data backing uh, to the assertion that diversity actually improves uh, teamwork. Uh, finally, one thing that we have to worry a little bit more about now is um, if we're all working from home, we don't run into each other as much. That's a, an important source of innovation, just running into people. So if we're not close to each other, if we have lower proximity, how do we maintain the serendipity, the chance meetings that bring so much productivity? Well, a professor at UCSD, Ulrich Shade, and I put a little piece out in the Nikkei um, uh, Asia Review a couple weeks ago on this. Basically, the idea is to use Zoom or other virtual meetings uh, and attach some AI functionality to them uh, so that uh, people inside a firm will just naturally bump into each other uh, as part of their daily work routine. Moreover, you could use the AI uh, to figure out how to make sure that the matching is a little bit better than just random. If we can do that, we can turn this work from home issue into actually a teamwork improvement element. And I think we would benefit even more because the diversity you get from that kind of an AI-based uh, interaction software algorithm uh, would uh, improve teamwork even more. So that's how I want to come at diversity. Well, that's very interesting. Um, since we were on the um, topic of now technology like Zoom, um, I, I was a first time Zoom user in this last year. I was using WebEx before and now there's five different platforms probably on my PC talking to various clients. But maybe we can shift gears in terms of again, trends that COVID has accelerated, and one of them is something that was also discussed this morning around digital transformation, whether it be in the workplace or at home. I wonder if you can comment on that. We've just done a study with about a thousand CEOs from around the world, and the data, however, is shocking. Everyone's talking about it, but uh, the success rate of corporate digital transformations is about 30% in the sample that we looked at, and in Japan, it was only 14%. Um, if I go one layer deeper, you know, who's leading the charge for digital transformation in corporate Japan or public Japan? Now we have a digital minister, that's good. One of the key success stories is to make sure that digital is 
being driven by the top, the C level suite, or the C minus one. Uh, if it's someone below the CFO in level three, the success rate also goes down. So in that context around digital, accelerating positive trends post-COVID, anybody like to start the conversation? Okay. And then I have Sam Robert, and then we'll go to the same. So uh, I think digital transformation is finally coming uh, in, to Daiichi. Uh, we all, always talked about digital transformation and, uh, and it is coming, uh, well, especially in life insurance, as I said, uh, human touch, uh, human consulting uh, is still the, the norm. And, um, and so, you know, it's like a, getting on a time machine. Uh, we said it was coming, but after the COVID hit, it came suddenly, and it's in, now it's inevitable uh, to pitch our sales without uh, remote devices. Uh, so it has finally come, and we got now we are getting used to it. So, as I said before, I never have done a, a, a web meeting for for 34 years career at Daiichi, but now I'm using it every day, uh, and we we now understand uh, how how efficient it is. Uh, and I think we, we will not go back to where we were. And the other thing is that um, if we can record and uh, uh, what the sales uh, reps are uh, doing at, at the ground level, uh, we can record that, we can digitalize that, we can analyze that. Uh, up until now, the, the front and sales negotiation or sales consultants was still a black box for us. Now we can digitalize that and analyze that. Um, and we have 40,000 sales reps throughout the Japanese archipelago in each communities. Uh, if we can now do a sales pitch remotely, everything might be done. Uh, well, the, 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 you know, there, there must be some person in each community, but uh, if it comes to tax-related matters or inheritance tax ma matters, which gets complicated, a, a, a professional from Tokyo can jump in to, to, to the Zoom devices and provide uh, professional consulting. So I think this, this push will uh, open up our glass ceiling uh, and our productivity might jump up. And that is what I'm trying to aim. Uh, through this digital well, transformation. Thank you for sharing your story. In, in, indeed, I was talking to a retail CEO who said he was forever trying to get e-commerce going, and of course, in the last seven months, <laughs> he said he accomplished what he had hoped to in the next five years, in the last five months. So there are some positive impacts, um, but I don't know, Robert, your comment on this particular topic about digital transformation acceleration. Let me give some personal experience from my teaching. Um, I'm now teaching in the Management of Technology program at Tokyo University of Science, uh, Tokyo Nikkei. Um, when COVID hit, um, I went to my you know, uh, boss and said, you know, there's this cool thing called Zoom. And I actually got a you know, subscription. I tried it out. It works pretty well. Give it a try. So he does it immediately. It works really well. He then goes to the president of the university and says, you know, we should be doing this. Within a couple of weeks, the entire campus was using Zoom. Okay? Now in my classes, for the entire first term, from April through uh, August, every class was on Zoom. I had a class of uh, 44. Uh, these are, they're all mid-career people. This is a mid-career program. They're working you know, and coming to school at the same time. For them, it was wonderful because they don't have to come to Kagurazaka anymore. They can tune in from home. If they have to work a little bit late, they can stay at the office, hook in from the office, but they're still attending the classes. It was much easier for the students to follow the materials because I could just put them on the screen and everybody has a screen. For me, it was great because I could tell who was sleeping. <laughs> Or more, nobody is sleeping in this class. They're paying to be there. So what I could really tell is, are they understanding what I say? That was immensely productive. Moreover, I think it was mentioned before, 
we have uh, a very disruptive technology for education. I want to talk to Jason about what he, he's learning on that. Um, because this technology could create a huge economy of scale in education. And so what I'm trying to push now is why don't we have sort of a, uh, call it a, a differentiated program. We give the same classes, but if you uh, can come to Kagurazaka, have them in, in person, you pay one fee. If you're online, you have another fee. If you're just listening online, you have another fee. We could actually expand the program uh, if we use the technology properly. So the key thing uh, comes back to reorganizing the, the company or the program around the new technology, just the way that Obana Nobunaga reorganized his forces around muskets and therefore won the battles. So we're facing the same issue, but I think it's very, very interesting uh, of how education is gonna change. When you bring, I was going to ask a completely different question, but then you brought Oda Nobunaga, so I'm not sure this is appropriate. But you know, as a parent of a college-age child who's supposed to go back uh, to the U.S. for his sophomore year, you know, some universities, for example, have raised tuition because they're saying, well, you know, we need the money now more than ever, and others have lowered tuition. As an economist, what is, what is the right thing here for academic institutions to do? in thinking about pricing, because I, I love your example about variable pricing depending on the experience. We don't have that chance usually. Well, for education, I don't know the answer, but we have a lot of experience, a lot of different industries of, uh, call it price discrimination. Uh, if you know that somebody lives in a rich neighborhood, you have one price. If you're in a poor neighborhood, you have another price. Um, when I order books from Amazon, uh, I, I've noticed uh, that the Kindle price is either equal or sometimes higher than the um, uh, paper book price. And I think the reason is that they know who I am. Anyone and, <laughs> and so they're probably, they're very smart. And you know, I'm kind of willing to pay a slightly higher price to get the book immediately, because typically I need it quickly. So I think it, we really need to learn a little bit more about the students, what they want, what they need, and then adapt the technology and the pricing to the market. But that, I'm afraid that's the best I can do. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you. Sorry for taking us down a tangent. But again, I think it's certainly this um, pandemic, ironically, has made us closer in that you can actually have those one-to-one -one interactions with people that used to be more handled on a mass scale. But back to you, uh, Tori-san, on digital transformation and your point of view. So let me just talk a little bit about the uh, commercial activities of pharmaceutical company. So the uh, key is uh, interaction with the medical doctors and that's done, uh, of course, physically, physical in person. Right now, industry has 60,000 salespeople calling up 100,000 doctors, so it's a very labor intensive. Now, even today, 80% 80, 80 of the hospitals do not like to see reps coming to visit them, and 50% of the clinics don't like them. So uh, we were forced into doing something different, so uh, reps have to find a way to uh, reach doctors through uh, maybe phone call, Teams, Zooms, uh, which is not easy. If you know the doctor, if doctors know you, it works. But if you try to call up on somebody new, <laughs> chances are doctors say, I don't know how to use it. Even if they, maybe they say they know it, but they say they don't know it because they don't like to talk to anybody, any stranger. So the key is really uh, like the insurance business. You know, We were forced into doing something different. So going forward, it's gonna be a hybrid mixture of the face-to-face uh, -face and also the uh, technology. So. Whoever can leverage digital transformation, uh, we will have a better chance to uh, succeed. So that's my view. Yes, let's hope some of these positive trends accelerate. But I think we only have about exactly 15 minutes left. So I'd welcome your questions from the audience. There's a Globus staff members. Uh, maybe you can bring the mic along. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Kawula Yapkent. I work for Tajan. I have a question, <coughs> sorry, um, regarding uh, innovation. Um, I appreciate um, remote work also, but I still think that real innovation comes also from real human interaction. And the best Teams meeting I ever had was still a question and answer session and not a deep discussion. So you really think? that innovation can be replaced uh, by a remote setting? 
Would not someone like to take that question? I will say, you know, companies on the West Coast, the, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world have said you don't have to come to work. Twitter has said you don't have to come. So certainly leading edge technology companies who may be icons of innovation are saying it's okay now. I don't think that means they'll stop innovation for a year, but uh, Robert, what were you about to say? Let me give you one example and then try to make a distinction. I just mentioned a couple minutes ago that I wrote a piece with a, a professor at University of um, uh, California, San Diego. She runs a Zoominar on Japan technology stuff. Okay. Cool, I know her, I participated in the seminar. So I'm on Zoom, she's on Zoom, the presenter is in San Francisco, the listeners are in London, New York, Tokyo. Okay. During the course of one of those conversations, uh, an entrepreneur, a Japanese guy who works in Silicon Valley, uh, talked about you know serendipity. And, oh, so I think, hmm, without proximity, what do we do about serendipity? So I send in the question. My professor colleague, uh, Professor Shada, comes back to me and says, I was gonna ask that too. We end the session, great session. I send her, hey, Lorca, let's write a piece, an op-ed together. So we did that. I never saw her through in, in person through the entire process. So there was human interaction, but it was intermediated electronically, but it was human interaction. The harder part is, would that ever have happened if I hadn't known her previously? That's a harder question. If I'd met somebody on Zoom, never talked to them before, but thought we might do something together, is the probability of that really generating something all that higher? So what I learned from that is, actually, you can have a lot of human interaction over the internet, but I'm not sure, and this is what we need to learn, whether the quality is quite as good. I'm afraid that's the best I, I can answer. Julissa. I agree with you. I think there are many things which cannot be achieved by uh, you know, working from home. When I talk to people, I mean, my colleagues, they all say it's working well, but I know it's not true. <laughs> Because you know, when you are, when you are meeting in the office, the most important you know period is the when you go, come out of the meeting room and go to the elevator hall. That's when truth comes out. You know, I I don't agree with what the boss said, but I can I can say it. <laughs> and uh, for instance, onboarding meetings. And I spoke to somebody last week who happened to have the new boss, and she was struggling because she never met the new boss. So many things. And uh, my concern, which I, I'm very very con very uh, care carefully is the, uh, there are certain things which are dropped, like networking, innovative spirit. So these are things we have to really be mindful and to make sure you provide such a forum. Otherwise, uh, these are things which you accumulate and competitiveness, we, we will be losing them. I think um, I've looked at the data, at least in Japan, around the work from home ratio and large corporates, of course, offer that. But if you look at companies with less than 1,000 employees, less than 100, you know, the vast majority of the economy is small businesses and they don't have the luxury of operating that way the whole time, right? And we're also talking about sectors like the service sector, the restaurant sector, you know, 25% of them may be out of business in the coming year. So I do think that the work from home piece is actually a privilege that um, larger companies with the infrastructure have been able to afford, um, afford and provide. Uh, so that might be, you know, give us hope for the rest of the economy that we'll properly figure out ways to come together sooner rather than later. But that would be my, my addition to the conversation. Any other questions, please? Oh, sorry, okay, um, please. Of course. Can I add a small comment? And then we'll go um, to you, sir, next. So we are now questioning our, uh, how we hire uh, new, so basically, uh, you know, old type uh, Japanese companies. Uh, we hire 150, 200 uh, newly college graduates. Uh, and, you know, our uh, employees are kind of a membership type of uh, employment. So. Uh, they go through an intensive uh, uh, training at the beginning for, for one or two months. And they, you know, uh, they embrace the, the camaraderies uh, between the, the like, uh, we, we enter Daiichi in 2020. So they go, so that Daiichi, you know, we, we rotate our employees in various divisions and they collaborate uh, informally, and they can help each other. And this, this 
kind of helps the, the creativity and innovation of Japanese companies, definitely. But now, uh, all the new, newly hired uh, this year, they cannot you know, go into the training center. They, uh, they study by themselves. And we don't have the camaraderies uh, between them. And that can cause you know, mixed uh, problems in the future. So that might change how we hire people. Uh, that can be an this uh, timing can be an inflection point, the way we hire uh, new, new recruits. Thank you. Question over and there, please. Sorry, by the way, we have two questions from um, the online participants. Okay, after this question, we'll go to the online right. ones. Yeah. Please, sir, can you, you can me tell okay? us who you are. Yeah. I'm, I'm Tad Wakamasu from General Motors. Um, about 80% of our employees are working remotely from home, and they want to continue that even if the COVID goes away. Um, all positive, but, but there were uh, talks about uh, particularly new members who don't feel of this belonging to the company or being part of the team. I'd like to ask uh, what kind of things can we do uh, as, as managers and, and to make sure all our employees believe they are included, uh, and also a, a way that we could promote um, more diverse ideas and different opinions uh, through the uh, digital communications. Any volunteers for that? Creating a sense of inclusion, affiliation. That's a tough one. Actually, really, uh, onboarding is tough, you know, so whenever new people join, which happens uh, to us, Asia people, I mean, they go to the office to make sure, you know, they take newcomers around, but uh, that's it. Since then, I mean, I spoke to a couple of people who joined the company last couple of months ago, and they are struggling, and uh, jobs can be done, but in terms of network, when you see people in person, physically, you get an impression, large, skinny, whatever. But you know, through screen, you don't get it. And so I think uh, minimum we, we can do, but I, I mean, we are struggling. We, we, we wish we have so, some good solutions, but that, that's a tough one. A couple things. One is my students at um, Rikadai uh, gave me a good hint on this. Um, they had a, uh, well, normally, you know, everybody is at Rikadai, they're in Kagurazaka, they finish their classes, they go drinking. Okay, can't do that now. So what they did is they organized a Zoom uh, nomikai, or drinking session. Uh, according to what they told me, uh, I wasn't invited. Um, <laughs> they started at, I think, eight o'clock, and it ended at 2.30 in the morning. They were all buying their own alcohol, sitting at home, but enjoying each other, and they used breakout rooms, uh, sort of, you know, every 30 minutes or so, they would just change. That might be a better way to do a uh, drinking party than a live one, because at a live one, you kind of go where your friends are. But on Zoom, you can make random breakout rooms, and so the interaction will be a little bit better. Now, what I did with my uh, uh, counter uh, or co-author, co uh, Professor Sheda, was in that article, I'll send you one, I'll, uh, give me your email, I'll send it, is we made some suggestions about using algorithms to enhance the interaction among your employees. How do you get them to come? Well, my uh, pr proposal was to have a, uh, you know, press, uh, get a brownie button. Okay, so if you're in the, 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 the Zoom session, you press a button and, you know, the company will send you a brownie or a pizza or whatever. Okay, uh, so if you can use food to get people to come into the sessions, then you will, you know, get people together. You can make it a little more random, a little less random as you need. But we're in the process of, of figuring out what those rules are. And it's just not just myself and Professor Sheda. There was a uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed, I think in mid-September, on, on the same issue. Um, and so there's some serious research about how this gets done. And we just have to pay attention and keep experimenting, be my, my view. Okay, food and drink always bring people together, for sure. <laughs> Why don't we uh, take the questions uh, from uh, the uh, virtual audience, please? Yes, uh, we have two questions. The first one is, uh, is from Chie Yasuoka-san. How would you deal with digital divide issues when implementing digital transformation, especially when your customers are age doctors or policyholders? So the question is how you reach them if they're not digital natives, is that the question? I guess that is the, yeah, the, the meaning of the question. 
Yes, uh, that is our challenge. Um, so it's, the, the situation is completely different uh, between the ages. Um, so younger generations, much more easier, and they, they tend to love uh, those, you know, talking through digital devices. But when we go to suburban areas, um, uh, old age, uh, they tend still uh, love to uh, communicate through face to face, and they they don't have the tech, uh, you know uh, they are not used to using uh, remote devices, and but we are th thinking that uh, our sales agents can be uh, the the evangelist. Uh, they can teach uh, our customers how to use Zoom and how to use Microsoft Teams and and. Uh, so, you know, I think that's another mission uh, to promote their quality of life under, under this, you know, with corona uh, situation. I can't get my 82-year-old father to stop chatting with his brothers on, on uh, electronic means these days, but perhaps we can go to the next question. The next question is, uh, the COVID-19 crisis unveiled the fact that C-suites can easily communicate with employees through digital applications. So do you think this new environment could change the long-lasting vertical organization and society in Japan? For example, maybe you need fewer middle management? <laughs> the question, just to make sure I got it right, now that we can go direct from CEO to first level employee, do we need the middle? Yeah. Well, you have like guys at the top here, so I don't know what they're <laughs> going to say, but we can ask the question. The messy middle. <laughs> I'll be careful in my comments. <laughs> Maybe some of our employees are watching this. But definitely, our, our work styles change, change, and you know. Um, so up until now, uh, people in the mid management uh, have they, they just send the message, pass on, passing on message uh, of the CEO or president or the uh, department head. Uh, is useless now. Uh, they, they, they have to have some kind of value added in, in their communication. So uh, I think it will change drastically, drastically. Yeah. I'll end it here. I think rather not, I mean, uh, the role of first line managers will really increase. You know, I mean, you never know uh, how everybody's feeling. And the only person who can really make judgment is somebody who is really leading that person. So uh, line managers, we have to make sure they are good line managers. It's really up to them to make sure everybody's happy. Actually, one of my students at uh, Rikadai is writing a thesis on that. And he noticed that um, he's about 40 now. The average age of the students is 43. Okay? He noticed that the uh, intensity of engagement of the younger guys is much lower than it was when he was in their position. And he says the reason for this is that there has been more and more and more hierarchy. As the firm got bigger, the pyramid got higher and higher and higher. So what he was doing had to connect to a, a very close uh, other team. But it was very easy because they were very close. Now there are one, two, three, four layers in the pyramid between him and that team. So the people at the bottom are just saying, we're being told what to do. We, we have no input. We don't like this very much. So what he's suggesting is that we have more sort of cross links among the middle managers. Because then it'll be easier for information to get from the bottom to another part of the bottom without um, going all the way to the top to come down. And probably more important, the middle managers would finally share a common agenda. So it could be that we won't have fewer middle managers, but we'll have more effective ones. That's the implication of his research. One of our uh, former CEOs wrote a seminal article about 25 years ago about jazz versus symphony. And I think symphony, if you think about traditional hierarchy and the exact notes you're supposed to follow, is indeed the old way of managing. By the way, he was saying that was the old way 20-something years ago. And I think crises like this that require agility, I think, do, do you know, impress upon us the importance of jazz. But even the best jazz uh, musicians are sometimes also trained in the classics, so I think it's a very good question. It's a challenge for the leaders. I think we have one, oh, it's time's up. Can I just get one, one comment each 
from each of the gentlemen on the panel in terms of your words of wisdom about how we now live with COVID. And we'll start from Robert and we'll go down. Quick comment and we'll wrap this up. If I can just make one quick comment. I think that as COVID you know, stays with us, the longer it stays with us, the more important social stability becomes. Therefore, the more important basic income becomes and the more attention we have to pay uh, to a society where the bottom feels like it's really participating. So that, I think, is the biggest challenge we face from COVID. Thank you, Robert. Can you have some? Yep. Uh, a, a consultant, uh, Mr. Kenichi Omae, <laughs> he said, to change people's behavior, you have to change your house. Either change your house, change the people you work with, uh, or change your time allocation. So under this COVID, uh, we shifted our work style, uh, we shifted our lifestyle, and time allocation. So. Uh, I'm very uh, optimistic. Uh, this can be a great opportunity for, for us to finally break through, achieve breakthrough, and open up our productivity and creativity. Thank you very much. Tori-san, last word. The uh, toughest part of COVID is the uh, uncertainty for the future. Nobody knows when and how it end may be coming, and nobody knows how the uh, new way of living looks like. But. Uh, the uncertainty should not be a reason for not acting. So time is now to act, to, to make changes. Now it's all, all up to us to, uh, you know, it requires a new mindset, but to do whatever you think is right and whatever fits the purpose of the company and yourself. Thank you very much. A big round of applause, please, for a fantastic <laughs> panelist. Thank you. Thank you. Globus.